All the Secret Postcards Written and read by Rod Duncan A fluorescent light is on, making dark mirrors of the windows. He must have forgotten to close the curtains last night. He pulled the alarm, the carer says. Told me he'd seen a ghost or something, or spoken to him. The daughter is all apologies for the bother of it but the carer shrugs it off, says it's all part of the job. He was confused more than scared, but I thought you should know, in case it's an infection or something. They have brought him a cup of tea. Somehow it is daytime. A blackbird is singing outside his care home window. The daughter and a doctor are talking near the sink, as if he won't hear them from the other side of the room, or won't understand. Memories are like postcards, says the doctor. You've got a box of them up here. He taps the side of his head. The thing is to keep the good ones to the top. Best not ask him about the ghost. The last words are whispered. Now the doctor's focus shifts to where he sits. What nice things can you remember? They say his memory is going but it seems to him the other way about. There are too many postcards. It's the sorting of them that he can't do, and knowing which are supposed to be secret. I remember the coronation buildings, he says, on High Street where the Singer Company had their office. All those sewing machines. I saw them build the place. The daughter seems embarrassed. Come on, Dad. You never saw that. You read about it, maybe. You're not that old. She tucks the blanket around him, as if he were the child. He thinks about the pushchair they used for all their daughters. It had a yellow canopy over the top. Take him out on visits, the doctor says. Places with good associations, that's the ticket. Can we go into Leicester, he asks. He is a child, six years old and trying to keep balance as the tram rattles over the points in front of the train station, heading for the clock tower. All the seats are taken and there is an expectant buzz of conversations. Above his head the hand straps dance. He cannot reach them but clings to his mother. They are standing in a department store, his mother is exploring a display of pale pink cloth patterned with tiny roses. But it might not drape so well, she says, then pulls out the end of another roll, feeling it between thumb and finger. This one is blue. The flowers are white. There is a loose thread hanging from the edge. He turns to look around. All the grown-ups have things to do, but there is a girl standing still watching him. When he smiles, she steps closer. Her clothes are different from everyone else's. She wears a straw hat and a white dress. The pleated skirts hang below her knees. One of her front teeth is missing. I'm Isabel, she says. Will you be my friend? Yes, he says, I will. And it feels important. His mother looks down, but doesn't seem to see the girl. That is when he knows he is speaking to a ghost. Memories are like postcards. You've got a box of them up here. The thing is to keep the good ones at the top. The doctor has been talking. What nice things can you remember? He asks. The daughter tucks the blanket snug around him. For a moment he thinks she is his mother. There are times when he knows he is confused, and times when he forgets. But he doesn't think the things he sees are any less real than they were when he could sort out who was who and arrange the postcards of his life in order. A woman brings him fish and chips and peas, calls him by his first name, touches his shoulder. He doesn't think that he has seen her before. There is a slice of lemon on the plate but no vinegar. He is nine, and the trams are all gone. 
Standing on the bus, he is just tall enough to reach the straps. He leans into the turn as they pass the station and start down Charles Street. His mother stands next to him. There is no hand-holding now. He is waiting for her near the clock tower, scraping lines in the dirt with the heel of his shoe. A man hurrying past throws down the butt of a cigarette. It sparks as it lands, and for a moment he is lost, watching the thread of smoke. Hello, says the ghost girl. He looks up and sees her grinning. A new tooth has started to grow where there was a gap before. Hello, he says not wondering that she has hardly aged, only that he forgot their last encounter. I didn't know if you'd still see me, she says. Why wouldn't I? You might be too busy. Who are you really? he asks. I'm your friend. He is upset and can't remember why. The daughter is stroking his hand. There is tea with a chocolate biscuit in the saucer. He watches the chocolate melting where it touches the cup. All the crockery in the nursing home is the same pale green. I'm sorry, he says. I didn't mean to make a fuss. It's all right, Dad. Let's think of something nice, shall we? Do you remember that place we went for beans on toast in the silver arcade? He does. It was right up at the top. And the old bookshop? the daughter asks. The turkey cafe? Mr. Wakerley is a nice man, he says. The daughter seems confused. Who's that, then? The architect. The turkey cafe is one of his, and the coronation buildings. The daughter grips his hand too tight. This time, when he takes the ghost girl's hand, he is taller, more an older brother, but it is she who leads them between the clock tower pedestrians. He feels a tickle on his shoulder, and it seems that instead of brushing past a woman in the crowd, he has gone through her, as if he is fading into the girl's time, becoming a ghost himself. The girl pulls him out of the road as a horse-drawn carriage clatters by. The clack of horseshoes on cobbles is so loud that he wants to cover his ears. His clothes are different to everyone else's, but no one seems to notice. She gives his hand another squeeze and sets off once more. They dodge shoppers and workmen, making a game of their run. First they head down Silver Street, then dive back through the arcade, shops to either side, the echoes of their footsteps ringing back at them. And then they are out, into the din of High Street. They are panting for breath by the time they reach the unfinished coronation buildings. Men are working high up where the roof will be. In his own time, the soot of coal fires will cling to its brickwork, but here all is fresh. The designs of the Union flags high on the wall are bright. It is easier to read the names of the Empire, Africa, India, Canada, Australia. Above each flag and name is an animal. At first, he thinks the ghost girl is pointing at the elephant above the name Burma, but when he crouches to look along her arm, he sees a man directing the builders. Mr. Wakerley, says the ghost girl. My daddy works with him. He gives me chocolates. The daughter's smile is fixed and tight. Dad, I was remembering, he says. Her smile relaxes. What were you remembering? Riding the electric tram, I couldn't reach the straps. And Lewis's on Humberston Gate. The market. Beans on toast in the silver arcade. That was with me, says the daughter. Up at the very top. I always loved that place. I was out of breath when we got there. And the girl, he says. Isabel. Your girlfriend? He shakes his head. No one else could see her. Then... Was she an imaginary friend? A ghost? The daughter frowns, trying to figure out whether the strange story that keeps surfacing is something from the fog of old age or the fog of early childhood. She opens her mouth, about to press the point to pin it down, but what difference would it make? 
What was she like? the daughter asks. Where did you meet? He is twelve, awkward in company, and too often lost in his imagination. Gym lessons will help turn him into a man, his father thinks. The real world doesn't wait for dreamers. On Saturdays he takes the bus to the haymarket, walks half the high street to get to the class. He used to look for Isabel among the crowds, but it has been three years. Once he tried to tell his mother about his friend, but she scolded him, sent him to his room. He doesn't look for the ghost girl any more. On this day, feet heavy, he slows in front of the coronation buildings. If he is late for the class, the gym master will shout at him. But the ordeal of it seems too much to bear. The cold changing room, the smell of sweat, being slower than all the other boys. He stops, looks up at the union flags and the animals and the names of places, finds himself thinking of chocolates, but doesn't know why. Once, the ghost girl had been easy to see, but now he understands how his mother had looked straight through her. She is with him, and yet not with him, caught between times and possibilities. He closes his eyes, trying to blink her out of his vision, or fully into it. When he opens them again, she is more than a shadow. She smiles, and he sees that the gap in her teeth has gone. Hello, she says. he says. There is relief in her face. Come, she says, quick now. We're just in time to see them go. Feeling awkward, he doesn't take her hand, but he follows, dodging the cars and buses, hurrying to keep up as they dip into an arcade, gym class, forgotten, the shops of his own time fading into hers. The streets behind seem strangely empty, but there is a sound ahead, like the sea. It is a crowd, a great gathering of people. Tens of thousands are standing in the market square. The sound is their whispering, their waiting expectation. All he can see is that ocean of people and a banner held above their hats, Leicester's unemployed. They march to London to ask for work, says the girl. They go to meet the king. He should be watching the spectacle of history being made, but it was so hard to see her this time, and suddenly he finds himself afraid. Will I see you again? he asks. I never liked gym lessons, he says. The daughter, who seemed asleep next to the hospital bed, opens her eyes. No one likes gym lessons. I skived off. Your grandfather shouted at me. <laughs> Come on, Dad. Let's think of happy things. His smile is tired, but it warms the daughter's heart. There are so many things now surfacing that he never told her before. The box of postcards in his head is becoming more vivid as the world recedes. She'll never know which ones are real and which were a child's make-believe, but she wants to know them all. Did you really skive off school? she asks. But he has gone again, into that place of memories. She looks at the lines of his face, each one lovely, as he stares out of the ward bay. And just for a moment, his eyes seem to find focus, and he smiles once more, as if at an old friend standing in the hospital corridor.